In this lecture, we're going to start on a section called Pressure Vessels and Combined Loading. Pressure vessels could kind of stand on their own, but most books uh, kind of include it with a chapter on combined loading. Uh, we'll get to combined loading in the next lecture, but today we're going to look at what are called thin-walled pressure vessels. So typical engineering applications of thin-walled pressure vessels could include things like piping, uh, the ends are open, LP gas storage tanks, cylindrical pressure vessels that hold gas, spherical chemical reactors, and uh, even something as simple as a beverage can uh, that is carbonated. Uh, those can all be considered different types of pressure vessels. Now, we will restrict ourselves in this course to what are called thin-walled pressure vessels. We'll explain why uh, very soon, but in a thin-walled pressure vessel, if you were to look at a circular cross-section for it, those are supposed to be concentric circles. It's hard to draw on this thing. But uh, what we want to do is we want to have the ratio of the inside radius to the wall thickness, T over R, to be less than or equal to about 0.1. If that's the case, then thin wall theory is applicable. So the T is the wall thickness, and R is the inside radius. Now, a lot of books just call them T and R, and sometimes it can be a problem because T and R are often used for other terms in different equations. I'm going to try to be a little bit uh, explicit here, and I'm going to put a subscript W for the wall thickness and a subscript I for the inside radius on these terms. Now, at the end of the lecture, I will drop them, and it'll, I'll look, uh, it'll look like the equations that our book uses uh, Craig, 3rd edition, Mechanics and Materials. Uh, but if you use a different book or if you use Craig, be careful. They sometimes reuse the symbols, but they mean different things. And thin wall pressure vessels, we're talking about the wall thickness of the pressure vessel and the inside radius. So the first thing we're going to look at is a uh, thin walled cylindrical pressure vessel. Think of the LP gas storage tank you might have seen sitting out behind the house or something like that. And I'll sketch that up in just a moment. Okay, so here we have a cylindrical pressure vessel. Of course, in a pressure vessel, you need some kind of outlet and inlet for the pressure, maybe some attachments for pressure gauges, some things like that. What we're interested in right now is just the bulk of the pressure vessel. So we're not going to be too concerned about the attachments. Those are important, though. And if you end up designing pressure vessels as part of your job or working with them, there's something called the ASME pressure vessel and piping code that you should be familiar with. And it talks about not only the bulk stresses in the in the pressure vessel itself, but also how to design connections and inlets and outlets. Right now, we're going to take things kind of simple and uh, just get our first introduction to pressure vessels by taking a look at the cylindrical pressure vessel. Now, most uh, pressure vessels are going to have some sort of end cap, whether it's a, a dome pointed into the pressure vessel or, in this case, a dome coming out of the pressure vessel. It's usually not flat. A flat pressure vessel uh, uh, end cap would not be very desirable because you don't have a way to counterbalance a lot of the, the pressure. So, uh, but we're not uh, interested in the end caps at this point. We're going to look at a special case of spherical end caps pretty soon. But for right now, we're interested in the main body of this cylindrical pressure vessel. There are uh, coordinate axes that we need to be familiar with. Down the long direction of the pressure vessel, that's going to be known as the longitudinal or axial direction. And around the circumference of the pressure vessel, that's known as the hoop or circumferential direction. So think of this like a beverage can on its side. Down the long direction of that can is, a, is the axial direction. And 
around the circumference then is the hoop direction. You can think of that like the hoop direction of a barrel if you would like. You've seen a barrel that has steel bands that go around it. Those are called the hoops for the barrel. Uh, those go around the circumferential direction. Okay, what we want to do is we want to take a look at the, the stresses that are in the wall of the material. I'm going to take this pressure vessel and I'm going to slice it down the long way and draw what this would look like. Okay, there's the wall of the material. That's on the top. Now I'm drawing the wall of the material on the bottom. And when I cut it, I have this curvy part that is the, the curvy part of the pressure vessel. Okay, so what we're looking at here is the inside surface. I'm going to put a dimension to this. I'm going to say that this length is delta x that I'm looking at down this way. And we talked about the inside radius of the pressure vessel. If I look at the diameter on the inside, that would be 2ri from uh, this top to the bottom down this way. Now, there's some sort of fluid in this pressure vessel. It could be liquid, it could be a gas. But an interesting thing about fluids is that if you pass a plane through them, then the pressure from that fluid would act normal or perpendicular to the plane that you pass through the fluid. This can be an, uh, a real plane, like a plate of steel you drop into water, or it could be some plane that you imagine. So right now we're going to imagine, let me use a different color, we're going to imagine a plane that is formed by connecting right through the middle of the pressure vessel and along this way. And in that case, the pressure from the fluid is acting perpendicular to that plane that I just sketched in. Now, to keep this object in equilibrium, there has to be a force that's associated with the stress that's in the material. And that force has to balance the force caused by the pressure. That force that we're talking about in the material can be represented as a stress through the wall thickness of the material. So let me put that in a uh, different color. I'll use this black color to re represent the stress that's being carried by the material. Okay, Now that's going to be the hoop stress. It goes around the circumference of the pressure vessel. I'll just call it sigma h pretty soon, uh, but that would be the hoop stress. And then the red arrows are the pressure. Now if I have a soda can and I shake it up, and it's closed up, and I put it on the table, I don't have to restrain that soda can. That can is in equilibrium all by itself. It is uh, in internal equilibrium. Even though there's lots of pressure inside of it, there's just as much pressure pushing up as down and, and so forth. So it, it balances itself. So we don't have to worry about external reactions unless we have a non-equilibrium pressure that goes on in this pressure vessel, a transient pressure. Right now we're just interested in static pressures. Okay, so what I can do then is I can do the summation of forces that go, let's say, this way in my pressure vessel. And if I look at the stress in the material, that would be my hoop stress. To get the force, I would take that by the wall thickness times that distance, delta x, and that would give me the area of this top surface, 
and I get the, the same thing for the area of this bottom surface in the material. So I'm going to take this number and I'm going to multiply it by 2. Now going the opposite direction, I have the pressure from the fluid and it's acting on an area that is 2 times the inside radius times the length delta x. And that's going to be equal to 0 for equilibrium. I want to emphasize where the different comes, terms come from based on the different colors I'm using here. Well, if we know what the pressure is in the fluid, we can solve for the hoop stress. Let's see, the delta x is common to both of these terms. The 2 is common to both of those terms. I can solve for the hoop stress. It's going to be equal to the internal pressure times the inside radius divided by the wall thickness of the pressure vessel. So that's one of the equations that we want to get in, uh, in no for the stresses inside of a pressure vessel. Now there's been a, an assumption that we made about the hoop stress. And this is where the thin-walled assumption comes in. We're assuming that the hoop stress is distributed uniformly through the wall thickness. So if we look on the inside radius or the outside radius of this pressure vessel, we get basically uh, the same stress. If we have a thick-walled pressure vessel, where T over the inside radius is uh, much bigger than 0.1, then we will get a substantial variation in the stresses from the inside to the outside radius. In that case, thin-walled pressure vessel theory doesn't apply. So let's write this down. Is that the assumption is that the, the hoop stress is constant through the thickness. And then uh, we want to make a note that, that this is okay for uh, thin-walled pressure vessels. All right, so now we have a formula that describes the hoop stress. If I were to draw a little stress block or a stress element on this pressure vessel, the hoop stress would be pointing up in this direction, and here we would have sigma h. All right, what we want to do next is we want to cut the end of the pressure vessel off and look at it down the end of it. Let me draw another picture. So now I'm cutting off that end cap, say. Try to draw this in 3D. Okay, there's the end of my pressure vessel. I've got my pressure from my fluid. Again, it goes in compression on imaginary surface that I'm passing through that fluid on the inside area of that pressure vessel. And now I'm going to have a stress in the material that will work to resist it. So we can keep that in equilibrium. For obvious reasons, this is going to be called the axial stress. And we can do the summation of forces down the axial direction of my pressure vessel. All right, if I want the force from the axial stress distribution, I'm going to take sigma axial times the area of that ring that I have uh, of material for the pressure vessel. We could do pi over 4 outside diameter squared minus pi over 4 inside diameter squared and find that area. However, if we know that we have a thin ring, then we can use a shortcut. And that shortcut is to take the circumference of a circle and multiply it by the thickness. So we have 2 pi r times the wall thickness. Now another point that I want to make is that in, in some books you'll see people use what they call the mean radius. And that would be the distance from the center of the circle to the middle of the ring. If you have a thin-walled pressure vessel, 
then we can get away with using the inside radius. And if we're talking about the, the stresses that develop, uh, it, it's not too, there's not much difference. So we're going to use the inside radius. That's what our book uh, is using. So we're going to stick with that. Now balancing that force has to be the force from the pressure. Okay, so that'll be P, the pressure, times the area on which it is acting. And the area on which it is acting is the inside circle area, uh, the inside area of the pressure vessel, pi over 4 times the diameter squared, or I'm going to write it this time, pi r squared, where I'm looking at the inside radius. Again, I'm using those different colors to emphasize where those different terms come from. But we can take now and we can this equation and solve it for the axial stress. Sigma axial, let's see, we have uh, the pi will cancel out on both of those terms. One of the radius terms will cancel out. And we're going to have left P times the inside radius divided by 2 times the wall thickness. So that will give us a state of stress that looks like this in our pressure vessel where now we have the axial stress, sigma A or sigma axial. So you want to know those two, two formulas. Now, there isn't any shearing stress in the hoop and axial coordinate system. for our cylindrical pressure vessel. Now we know what that kind of stress state is called. That's called a principal stress state when you don't have any shearing stress. If you were to take a balloon, picture one of those long balloons that you can blow up, blow it up a little bit, just enough so you can get a marker and draw a square on it. And if you were to blow it up some more, then that square would maintain right angles, but it would turn into a rectangle as you blew it up some more. There's no shearing stress. There's nothing to cause a change in those angles in the hoop and axial coordinate system. Now, that doesn't mean there's no shearing stress. You can look at shearing stresses off at a different angle, but in the hoop and axial coordinate system, that's the principal stress directions. Let's show a more circle for our stress state on the next page. Okay, so here I have a sketch for a more circle. And I'm going to put on the, the values for my hoop and axial stresses. Now I know that uh, it's a principal stress state. So if this is my horizontal axis of more circle, I'll try to pencil this in. And I know the, the hoop stress is bigger than the axial stress. So this point will be uh, sigma hoop, comma, zero. I know that they're the endpoints of the Mohr circle because it's a principal stress state. So this is going to be PR over T, comma, zero. Again, the R is the inside radius, T is the wall thickness. When we do our more circle, the horizontal axis is the sigma axis, and the tau axis is positive down this way. Some people put uh, arrows that go clockwise and counterclockwise on this, but I'm going to use the convention that a positive shearing stress is pointed downward. Now my axial stress, the smaller one, will be this side of the more circle. That's going to be sigma axial comma zero which is equal to sigma, uh, excuse me, PR over 2T comma zero. Now this also makes uh, the center of our circle right here, the center of our circle being uh, three quarters PR over T. It's the average of those two. Now we can calculate a maximum in-plane shearing stress 
being the radius of our 2D circle. And in this case, it would be uh, one quarter PR over T. And as we rotate through different angles, we can find different combinations of normal and shearing stresses on inclined planes. Some of your homework problems will involve taking a look at welds at an angle uh, to make a pressure vessel out of a helically welded steel plate. You can find the normal stresses and shearing stresses on those wells by doing a more circle analysis. We have to be a little bit careful now when we talk about the absolute maximum shearing stress. The absolute maximum shearing stress will depend on whether we're on the inside or the outside of the pressure vessel. So here we are with a side view, and this is what our stress state looks like. But if we kind of zoom in on the, the wall of the pressure vessel, here it is kind of curvy. On the outside of the pressure vessel, we have atmospheric pressure. And on the inside of the pressure vessel, we have the, the gauge in the atmospheric pressure. Uh, we're just going to worry about the gauge pressure for our purposes. But the, the gauge pressure is pointing inward on this wall. So this little square that I have drawn here, on the outside of the pressure vessel, will be a little stress element that looks like this. Now, if we think of the axial direction as being like the x direction for our more circle analysis and the hoop direction being for the y direction, what we're seeing is the hoop direction coming out this way, or the y direction, and the axial direction coming out of the page at us. Perpendicular to that would be the z direction. And on the outside of the pressure vessel, we would not have any pressure. If it's just atmospheric pressure, we're going to ignore it. 14.7 PSI compared to the stresses inside the pressure vessel is nothing. So our Mohr circle for the outside of the pressure vessel, the complete 3D Mohr circle, would look something like this. I will draw another circle that connects with 0, comma 0, to my principal stress on the left side of that circle. So I'm trying to draw another circle of equal size. So this point right here is 0, comma 0, which is sigma z, comma 0, on the outside of the pressure vessel. If I wanted to draw the 3D Mohr circle to complete this, then I would connect my minimum principal stress to my maximum principal stress over here. I would have a larger circle that would connect those. I'm sorry, my circles don't look very good, uh, but uh, just imagine that's a nice looking circle. It's kind of hard to draw on this tablet. So then our absolute maximum shearing stress on the outside of the pressure vessel would be equal to the radius of our biggest circle would be equal to the hoop stress minus 0 over 2. So tau maximum absolute would be equal to half of PR over T. If we're on the inside of the pressure vessel, then we have uh, for our third stress, principal stress, sigma z, the value of the pressure. On the inside of the pressure vessel, if we take a look at our little element right here, now we have the hoop stress, which we're assuming constant through the wall thickness. We have our axial stress that comes out of the page at us, and our z-direction stress would be equal to minus the value of the pressure. It would be in compression, so that gives us a negative stress. But that value would be equal to the pressure. Let me clean this picture up just a little bit, and I'll show you what more circle would look like on the inside of the pressure vessel. All right.
So we have our 2D circle over here. We have this point, sigma hoop, comma, zero. Here's our point here, sigma a, comma, zero, sigma axial. And our third principal stress would be plotted over here on the inside of the pressure vessel. It would be minus p, comma, zero. So let's write over here on the inside of the pressure vessel. Sigma z would be equal to the value of the minus of the internal pressure. So that gives us a little bit bigger absolute maximum shearing stress. So the absolute maximum shearing stress on the inside of the pressure vessel is sigma hoop minus a negative pressure divided by two. Now, since the absolute maximum shearing stress is the biggest stress and it's associated with the 3D circle, we would say that the absolute maximum shearing stress occurs 45 degrees out of plane. Physically, what this means for our pressure vessel is that if we have a ductile material that our pressure vessel is made out of, the maximum shearing stresses should occur at a 45 degree angle through the wall thickness of the material. The angle would be in between the hoop direction and the Z direction. So it would shear through that wall thickness at a 45 degree out of plane angle, where the plane that I'm talking about is the surface of the pressure vessel. It's kind of an important thing to, to understand. If you're looking for shear cracks on a pressure vessel, they should run at a slant to the wall thickness at a 45 degree angle. Almost all your pressure vessels are going to be made out of ductile materials. We know ductile materials fail because of high shearing stresses. So that's where we're going to look for fatigue cracks or uh, shear cracks of any sort. Most pressure vessels are not made out of brittle materials. Uh, for obvious reasons, it would tend to uh, shatter instead of deform and let the air escape. It could be very dangerous to make a pressure vessel out of a brittle material. All right, so now we know what the state of stress looks like uh, for a cylindrical pressure vessel. We're going to repeat this type of process for what's known as a spherical pressure vessel. So we have our spherical pressure vessel sitting here, and it's in equilibrium again all by itself. You can think of this maybe like a beach ball or, or something. Sometimes I'll see some of these spherical pressure vessels uh, as I go through uh, driving near chemical refineries. Um, they're not, they don't seem to me to be as common as uh, cylindrical pressure vessels, uh, but you do see these from time to time. Now, due to the symmetry of the pressure vessel, when we fill this up with pressure, I can draw a little stress block or stress element anywhere on the surface of this pressure vessel, and I will get a symmetric, what's known as an equal biaxial stress state. And I'm going to call the spherical pressure vessel stress sigma s. We're going to determine what the sigma s value is by cutting through the middle of this spherical pressure vessel. Okay, so just imagine I'm cutting that in half. By the same reasoning that we had previously, we're going to have some pressure acting on the inside area of that circle. And resisting it, we're going to have some stresses carried by the material in the wall of the material. All the way through here, and I'll call that sigma s. If we do the summation of forces like we did before, we're going to have the force carried by the, the material 
the stress times the area on which it is acting. Again, because it's a thin ring, we can approximate this by 2 pi times the inside radius times the wall thickness of the material. Counteracting that, going the opposite way, is the force from the pressure. So that would be minus P times the area on the inside of the pressure vessel when we cut right through the middle. It's going to be pi r squared equal to zero for equilibrium. We can get a few things to cancel out. The pi's cancel out. One of the inside radius terms cancel out. And we can solve for the spherical pressure vessel stress, which is going to be equal to P times the inside radius divided by 2 times the wall thickness. And a lot of times you'll see me write it this way, PR over 2T. But again, I just want to try to emphasize that that is uh, the inside radius and the wall thickness that we're talking about. We still need a thin walled pressure vessel theory to apply in order to use this, so we're still looking for uh, the wall thickness to inside radius ratio of 0.1 or less. So we can do the same sort of thing now. Uh, this is also a principal stress state. We don't have any shearing stress in the in this system. If we were to draw a square on a beach ball, blow it up some more, uh, we would get that square getting bigger without any changes of angle. No shearing stress in this coordinate system. So let's write this down. This is also a principal stress state. So we can do our more circle analysis again. All right, so there's my axis for my more circle analysis. And I go to plot my points. I know that I can plot my X point as, uh, let's see, if we call this like the X, and this is the Y direction here, it would be sigma X comma zero uh, because it's a principal stress state. That would be the spherical pressure vessel stress. I plot my y point. Okay, let's see, my y stress is sigma s comma zero. And then I plot the center of my circle, which is sigma average comma zero. And I know that uh, that will also be sigma s comma zero. So here's my horizontal line. This is my sigma axis. This is my tau axis down this way. And well, all three of these points are the same. Two D Moore circle is a point. Okay, that's kind of interesting. Um, there's no radius to a point, so the in plane maximum shearing stress. is zero. Now what that means is I can take my block that I have on that picture and I can rotate it to any angle I want in the plane and I will keep the exact same value of stresses pointing perpendicularly to, to each other, sigma s and sigma s. And that makes a lot of sense on the surface of this pressure vessel because of the symmetry of the shape of this object. I can't tell if it's a perfect sphere where I should draw my square at. Any angle will give me the same equal biaxial stress state. Well, although the maximum in-plane shearing stress is zero, we have to be really careful. The absolute maximum shearing stress will not be equal to zero. On the outside of the pressure vessel, sigma z is equal to zero. So we do have another more circle we need to draw. This point here would be 0, comma 0. And this would be on the outside. So on the outside of the pressure vessel, tau maximum absolute would be the radius of that biggest circle. 
Let me clean that up just a little bit. Now it's going to be my spherical stress minus 0 over 2. On the inside of the pressure vessel, sigma z is equal to the negative of the pressure. Let me draw this on the same plot. And I'll use the red color. And I'll dash it in. And so that would make tau maximum absolute on the inside of our pressure vessel sigma s minus the negative of the internal pressure divided by 2. It would be a little bit longer, a little bit larger. And so again, our maximum absolute shearing stress would be associated with a 3D circle. We would expect a 45 degree out of plane maximum shearing stress failure if we had this made out of a ductile material. All right, so let's review just a little bit. On the outside of our pressure vessel, we have, for a cylindrical pressure vessel, a hoop and axial stress state given by the axial stress being PR over 2T and the hoop stress being PR over T. On the outside of a spherical pressure vessel, you can think of that as a more efficient shape if you'd like. We have lower stresses than the hoop stress. In both directions, we have PR over 2T, where P is the internal pressure, R is the inside radius of the pressure vessel, and T is the wall thickness of the pressure vessel. Uh, the only thing, uh, there's only a couple things that I've seen students uh, over the years kind of get wrong on these types of problems. And one is forgetting which one is the hoop stress, which one is the axial stress. The hoop stress is the larger of the two stresses. One way that you can think of that is uh, kind of relates to uh, maybe some cooking experience you might have had. Uh, you can think of a uh, hot dog as a cylindrical pressure vessel. Hot dog is filled with meat, of course, but around the outside is a casing. And if you've ever boiled a hot dog and you keep it in the pot for a while, you'll notice that there's a split that occurs along the length of the hot dog. That split is caused by the hoop stress exceeding the strength of that casing. So if you want to remember the difference between the hoop stress and the axial stress, it's the hoop stress that's the bigger one, PR over T, as opposed to the axial stress, PR over 2T, based on the, the way that that hot dog casing fails. Uh, I don't know what happens in a microwave. I think you can get some kind of weird things going on. You may not have a uniform pressure in the microwave, but when you um, put it in, a, in water and boil it, you'll get the, the hot dog to fail that way. And then, like I said, you can remember on a spherical pressure vessel that that's a more efficient shape than the uh, cylinder, and so it has lower stresses overall, which they're both PR over 2T. Now, the other thing that I've seen from time to time, students kind of mess up, is being able to calculate the wall thickness of a pressure vessel. So let's take a look at the end view of a pressure vessel. I'm going to try to do my best to make this not look too bad. Those are supposed to be uniform all the way around. Sorry for the, the poor circle. In fact, let me uh, let me draw something real quick uh, in my sketcher. Okay, that looks a lot nicer. So there's a cross-sectional view of one of my pressure vessels. And, uh, you know, when you take a measurement on something of like a tube, it's impossible to measure the inside radius of a tube. What you end up doing is you measure the inside diameter and you measure 
the outside diameter. Use some sort of caliper or some kind of measuring device. And let's say that we come up with an inside dimension of 9.8 inches. And we come up with an outside dimension of 10.0 inches. If we were to calculate the wall thickness of this pressure vessel, the wall thickness would be equal to 0 0.1 inches. Okay, so be really careful. The wall thickness would be here. It would be equal to the outside diameter minus the inside diameter divided by 2. Okay, so be careful with that. Uh, if I put the on a test, uh, pressure vessel, I will give you the inside and outside diameters. Like I said, it's impossible to measure the inside radius. All right, so watch out for those little things, and um, if you have any questions, please let me know.